So you have seen in the previous lectures how we can use the knowledge about the robotic system, like its configuration and weight, to define a dynamic model and a controller for our robotic hand. So what if instead we could simply give some high-level inputs to our customized algorithm, for example, that it should grasp the object, place it over there, and then the algorithm would just learn through trial and error how to do that. Well, we can do this using a technique called reinforcement learning that uses neural networks and observations of the system and how it interacts with the environments. And with that, it will learn a controller. So you have already seen a neural network that predicts an output. We covered it in the last lecture. There we talked about how we can use them in the application to computer vision tasks such as classification or object detection. Neural networks are composed of several layers of neurons that are interconnected by adjustable, or let's say, adaptable weights. So these networks are capable of learning a function of the input data by processing a very large number of samples. In the previous lecture, the function we wanted to learn was whether an object is in the scene or not. And also the inputs that we used, those were images. So let's start with part one on reinforcement learning. Well, let's first introduce the building blocks of reinforcement learning. And those will allow us to understand the algorithm later on much better. In this case of the so-called model-free reinforcement learning algorithm, our robot is called the agent. So the agent can see at each time step t that it is at the state s. At each of these time steps, the agent performs an action a. The action is then applied to the world where it lives in. We call that world the environment. And the action then moves the agent into a different state that we will call s prime. The environment also outputs a reward value called r for each action the agent performs. So this reward value is modeled as a function of both the current state s and also the action performed in this state. The rewards are key since the goal of the agent is to maximize these. So one important assumption this model has is that the state where the agent is moved to is only dependent on the action and the previous state, on not anything else. So this assumption is called the Markov property and the whole representation of the world and the robot is called the Markov process. So after introducing the structure with which the robot interacts with the environment, we need to also present the concept of policy. The policy is our learned controller. It's a function of the agent state S and it outputs the ideally optimal action that the agent should perform to maximize the reward. So now speaking of reward, which rewards do you think would be better for the agent to maximize? The immediate rewards or the future ones? So in practice, we would like our agent to maximize the expected reward from the state S onward. From time step zero, all the way up to infinity. However, since we still want to care more about the immediate rewards, we are also going to introduce a hyperparameter called gamma. Gamma, which is basically the discount factor. So while estimating the reward, we will exponentiate the discount factor by the power of the time step, t. That effectively reduces it to zero as time goes on towards infinity. Well, we have to also understand the the discount factor has to be bound between zero to one. So we start at one and we work our way down to zero. So the sum of these discounted rewards that is estimated from the current time step to infinity, that is called the cumulative reward. So if we set the discount factor to zero, then our agent will learn to only maximize the reward for the next action while completely ignoring the successive one. So that means there's no horizon that looks forward in this case. So on the other hand, if we test the discount factor really close to one, 
but still below the value one, then the agent will care almost equally for all the next rewards from the current time step on. So a typical value for the discount factor would be 0.9. So while approaching the topic of reinforcement learning, so there are two quantities we have to look at more closely. It's the value function and it's the Q function. The value function is the expected value of the cumulative reward. And that reward is what the agent would receive in the state S. So it is a function of the state S that describes how good a state is in terms of expected rewards. So on the other hand, the Q function also describes the expected cumulative reward from the state S. But this time it also depends on the action A that the agent performs in state S. So when we compare it with the value function at the same state S, it gives us some understanding of how good one action is compared to all the other possible actions. So for this reason, the value function tells us how good a state is, considering all the possible outcomes for each action. Also, the Q function gives us an intuition on which action is the optimal one given a current state. So now we have everything we need to properly define the reinforcement learning approach. In this algorithm, we aim to find an optimal policy pi such that it maximizes the value or the Q function. So we do that by estimating these quantities during the training phase. Let's see one possible approach to update our estimate of the Q function using an algorithm that is named Q learning. In Q learning, the agent performs an action based on the state it is currently in. It then observes the rewards in the next state it finds itself in. Afterwards, it calculates the temporal difference value by summing the reward with the discount factor times the maximum Q value at the state the agent ended up in minus the current estimate of the Q value in the initial state and also given the action the agent took. Well, that's a lot to process. I hope you can also follow it based on what I'm showing you here on this slide. This temporal difference is then multiplied by an hyperparameter alpha called the learning rate and summed to the current estimate of the Q value in the initial state and given also the action the agent took. So this algorithm is defined as an off policy algorithm since it allows to firstly record all the transactions and then it performs forms the Q-value estimate updates. So on the other hand, an on-policy algorithm needs to use the current most up-to-date policy to collect the data that updates the policy. Okay, there's one problem with the given approach we presented so far. We currently have selected the action that will be performed given the state S by taking the action that maximizes the Q-function. However, this could be really complicated when the actions are highly dimensional. So to solve this problem, we are going to introduce a more sophisticated architecture, and that's called the actor critic. In this model, we use two separate neural networks. One to learn the Q function, as we did before, but also another one, let's call that the second part, that learns the best action given the state S. The network predicting a Q function is called the critique, while the one predicting the best action is called the actor. All right, so we presented a simplified approach to reinforcement learning, but there are a lot of different algorithms that combine different techniques to enhance the performances. One very common algorithm is called deep deterministic policy gradients. This algorithm assumes the policies to be deterministic and estimates the Q value through the critique network. Another widely used algorithm is proximal policy optimization, PPO, where the policy updates are constrained to be close to the previous policy to ensure stable updates. Finally, a more recent approach called soft actor critic uses entropy regularization to allow the policies to explore more. All right, let's proceed with the second part on imitation learning. In the last section, we have seen how we can design reward functions to 
somehow shape the behavior of our agent. Sometimes choosing good reward functions is very complicated, especially when the states we can observe are high dimensional, like pictures, for example. So what can we do to train a model in these cases? Well, while formulating a proper reward function could be tricky, we could instead focus on imitating a behavior from somebody or something else. So the transitions are sampled from an expert, which we want to imitate with our model. The expert could be, for example, a human operator performing the task, or a controller that has access to additional information, such as the 3D position of the robot in the space. So from the perspective of the final class challenge, we could record data of a person grasping an object and then use this data to train the model. So as we have just seen, we need an expert model that the student will later try to clone using a different representation of the environment. There are two main ways to do this. We can use a recording of a human performing the task. We have to use many of these. Or we use a different algorithm, such as reinforcement learning, to get a better performing model. So in terms of the final challenge again, we could record a human with a motion capture camera that allows us to precisely estimate the 3D pose of each segment of the arm. And we're not only capturing the arm, but also the hand of the human, all while the human as the operator performs this grasping task. So this approach has the upside of closely following the trajectories that a human would follow while grasping that same object. But at the same time, it could be difficult to record the hours and hours of footage and 3D poses required to train this student. For this reason, we could create an expert by training an algorithm in simulation that has access to privileged information about the environment that simplifies the task a little bit, like the object position as we have previously seen. So while this additional information is helpful, we could set up a simulation where we could use a dynamic controller that is very precise and efficient since we have perfect knowledge in that simulation. We know where the object is, we know where the hand pose is at each time step. So both solutions have their advantages and also their disadvantages. So it really depends on the task and the experiments which we set up and prefer in the end. So the easiest approach for the training is to record both the expert and the student observations per step in the demonstration data. For example, the real-world coordinates of the object and the robotic hand poses and the pictures from the onboard camera. So then we feed the poses to the expert, which will output the correct actions that we would want our students to perform in that configuration. At the same time, we also feed the images through the student, which will also output the action predictions. We will perform the same learning process we did in the last lecture when we wanted to predict the class of object present in the image. So this will result in the student network learning how to clone the expert network with different input representations of the environment. This approach is the easiest one and it is known to only be able to generalize a little. More advanced techniques such as dataset aggregation or generative adversarial imitation learning try to improve learning by using specialized techniques such as mixing the action of the student and the expert or using adversarial networks to improve stability. So far we have shown to you how to learn a controller using reinforcement learning or imitation learning. In a few lectures before this one, you have seen how we can simulate our environment using frameworks such as Isaac Chim to train our algorithm on multiple and parallel environments all at the same time. However, there is one aspect that we have not covered yet.
So when we deploy the algorithm previously trained in a simulated environment, in the real world, it might perform poorly due to the so-called sim to real gap. The phenomenon represents the difference in the algorithm performances between the simulation and the real world. And it just exists due to the modeling errors that are always present in the simulation. So there are several ways to reduce the error. The most obvious one is to perform system modification and improve the modeling of the system. Even though this method is very effective in reducing the error, it's normally very difficult to get an almost perfect model match. So we normally opt for different solutions. So one of these solutions is using a neural network to learn the difference between our simplified model and the actual robot. This technique is called residual learning and it can greatly improve the accuracy of the simulation. Another solution consists in adding domain randomization to the model. In this method, the parameters of the model, such as mass, and inertia, they are perturbed and noise is added to the observations to resemble the actual measurements. You can see on the right of the slides how we are simulating a large number of hands. Each one is slightly different from the other due to this domain randomization in the parameters. All right, let's now recap what you have learned during this lecture. We have first recapped the concept of neural networks that we already introduced in the last lecture when we used them to classify images. We then introduced the setup used to describe the reinforcement learning interactions. We described how our agent interacts with the environment and all the quantities that are involved in that process, such as rewards, actions, and observations. After we present you with the setup, we explore the concept of policy and how the reward is scaled in order to weigh the future rewards more or less. Then we introduce the value function and the Q function and show it how we can use them in a simple reinforcement learning algorithm called Q learning. Afterwards, we introduce the concept of the actor critic model due to its capabilities with high dimensional observations. We also briefly discussed some state-of-the-art algorithms that use this approach. Well, the, the learning is achieved through observing an expert performing a task that we want to perform. We have seen two different examples of experts, one purely from human inputs and the other one through the use of additional information and an existing controller using them as inputs. From the algorithm side, we have presented the simplest approach for imitation learning, where each sample observation and action are used to directly train the model, and we have then briefly introduced its limitations. Finally, we highlighted how we have presented approaches which heavily rely on simulation for the training. However, the simulation and the real-world dynamics often behave very differently for this exact reason. So we present the most common way to deal with this issue and to try to mitigate it.